بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to this new episode of Ask Huda coming to you live from Cairo, Egypt Brother Jason with an M says when we join salah in which the imam has finished fatiha and going towards rukur we don't get enough time to complete our fatiha is our rak'ah valid with an incomplete fatiha only recited two to three verses the scenarios are different one scenario is that you come and you find the Imam in the position of rukur. So the Sunnah is that you say Allahu Akbar for joining the Salat and without any dua, without any Bismillah, Audu Mishtan al Rajim, without any uh, inauguration dua, Subhanak Allahu Muhammadik Tabarak Smukta al Jadduk Wala ilaha Gayruk, without anything, you say Allahu Akbar and go for rukur. And if you said only once, Allahu Akbar, and performed rukur, this suffices. Scenario two, the Imam is in the standing position, and I say Allahu Akbar, as I'm beginning my Fatiha, he makes rukur. Either it was a loud rak'ah, like the first two rak'ahs of Fajr, Maghrib and Isha. In this case, his recitation of Fatiha suffices for me. So, even if I started one or two verses, or I did not start at all, I say Allahu Akbar and join him in Rukur. If it's a silent rak'ah, which means that it is a pillar for me to recite it, if the time is not sufficient for you to complete your Fatiha before he raises his head from Rukur, and this might be due to your slowliness. Some of the brothers take their time, especially in such limited situations, time restraints, they joined the Imam say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. The Imam would have finished the whole prayer by the time you finish your Fatiha. In this case, this is their problem. And they complain. The Imam always goes to Rukur and we're not through half of the Fatiha. And we ask them, what about the rest of the congregation? What about the rest of the worshippers? They say, no, they have no problem with that. Then it's your problem. You're the one who has a big problem in the speed of reciting the Fatiha. It's not normal what you're doing. And usually, I'm not talking about normal rak'ah. I'm talking about this particular scenario where the Imam is in Rukur. So if you can wrap your Fatiha up before he raises his head from Rukur, you must do that. And you should do it in a very quick fashion by saying Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawm Al-Dini Iyaka Na'budu Iyaka Nasta'inu Dina Salat Al-Mustaqim Salat Al-Ladheena An'amta Alayhim Ghayr Al-Maghdub Alayhim Ar-Dhaleen How long did that take? Maybe six seconds? Is it sufficient for you to say Allahu Akbar and bow with or perform rukur with the Imam? This is the accepted scenario. Now, the third scenario would be that you do not recite it this fast, and you take your time, and having said that, you have a problem, because then your rak'ah would not be valid. 
the recitation of the Fatiha is mandatory. It is one of the pillars of Salat in silent rak'ahs. So if the Imam gave you enough time, but it was your mistake not to utilize the time and you took your time reciting part of the Fatiha until he performed Rukur and raised his head from Rukur, then you've got a problem and you have to make up for that prayer. And Allah Azza wa knows best. Abdurrahman, he says, if a person travels to Mecca, is he allowed to combine and shorten his salawat, his prayers, for four days? And after the four days, he doesn't combine and shorten them if he stays for 10 days in Mecca total. Also, can you please send your evidences? Well, Brother Abdul Rahman is asking about the duration of praying shortened prayer for a traveler. So is there a specific period of time prescribed by Sharia for a person to shorten his prayer and afterwards he may or he must complete it? It's an issue of dispute among scholars. Some scholars say that if you intend to stay in the city, in your destination, more than four days, then you have to complete. So if you stay there for four days, you shorten. And the fifth day, you complete your, two raka, your four rak'ah pray, prayers. You pray them as it is, as four rak'ahs. Others say, no, if you stay longer than 17 days or 19 days or 11 days or different number of days. And none of these evidences were prescribed by the Sunnah. Rather, it was an incident that the Prophet Hassan traveled and he, for example, stayed for four days and left. So they looked at it and said, ah, oh, okay, he stayed four days and then he left, then four days is the minimum. Or that is, let me rephrase that, it is the maximum. Others say, no, he went in the Battle of Tabuk for so long, or he stayed in Mecca, in the conquest of Mecca on the eighth year of Hijrah for uh, uh, so many given days, and he shortened. So each one looked at an incident where the Prophet والسلام, shortened his prayers uh, 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 over the duration of the journey where he stayed in that place but there isn't anything to prove to us had it been longer that the Prophet would have completed never ever and therefore this is what caused a lot of the companion of, of the scholars who looked into all of these evidences and said that nothing stands for specifying the duration of shortening the prayer. Nothing stands to prove that. And the choice of Shaykh al-Islam bin Taymiyyah and also Shaykh ibn Uthaymeen and a great number of uh, uh, scholars, they say that as long as you are a traveler, you may shorten. And when we say traveling or a traveler, we do not mean that a person commuting from one city to the other. So within these two cities or towns, he's a traveler. No, once a person leaves his hometown and exits the borders of his own hometown traveling anywhere, then he's a traveler until he comes back. So this is the norm. You go out for a week or two or for a month, and you are a traveler. Once you go back, you become a non-traveler, a, a, a resident. But if a person travels and he goes to this second city and settles down, like a student who has a scholarship for two years, maybe he would shorten for a couple of weeks, but once he rents an apartment, furnishes it and knows the times of prayer and get acquainted to the city, he becomes a resident and then he has to complete. We have a caller. 
ابو عبد الرحمن فم سعودي السلام عليكم ورحمه الله السلام ورحمه الله وبركاته I have a question, Sheikh, regarding a hadith of the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام and how how to apply it. I don't remember the exact word for word, but it is regarding a situation when somebody visited the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام at the house and he was a man of maybe a little bit bad manners, and the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام met him in a very nice way, smiled at him, brought him in the house, talked with him in a very open way. And then when he left uh, Aisha, she asked the Prophet ﷺ, how come you were so nice to this person, even though that he's known with his uh, bad manners? Uh, how, do we, how do we draw the line of who to treat like this and who not to treat like this, where we don't cross the, uh, the uh, definition of being hypocrite sometimes? Okay. How, how, who do we treat like this and who we don't treat like this? Okay, Abu Abdul Rahman, do you have a second question? That will be it for now, Zakir. Wa jazak. Brother Abu Abdul Rahman is asking about a hadith which was narrated or narrated by Mother Aisha, and it was reported in Sahih al Bukhari and elsewhere. So it is the highest degree of authenticity. It's definitely authentic. It's in Bukhari. And it was mentioned in Kitab al-Adab. Aisha said, may Allah be pleased with her, with her, a man sought permission to enter the gathering of the Prophet ﷺ in his house. So the Prophet said to his companions, بِئْسَ أَخُ الْعَشِيرَةِ فُلَان In another narration, بِئْسَ أَخُ الْقَوْمِ فُلَان He says that, that this person is the worst of tribesmen or of a people. So he is telling those about a man who's about to come in. Then the Prophet said, allow him in. When the man came, the Prophet smiled to his face and he made him sit next to him. The Prophet honored him, hosted him, gave him things to drink and eat and dealt with him in a nice fashion. When he left, Mother Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, asked the Prophet والسلام, because she was astonished. She said, oh, Prophet of Allah, you said so-and-so about this person. And then when he came in, he, you treated him as a royalty, as a VIP. What, is, what was this all about? So the Prophet ﷺ said, that, uh, in, in different narrations, in one of them, if I recall correctly, he said, since when, Aisha, did you see me being vulgar or being harsh? And the Prophet continued to say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Inna sharra al-qawmi man ittuqiya makhafata fuhshih. He said that you will find among the worst of people those whom others are intimidated or in a sense they protect themselves fearing that he would transgress against them. So that person is one of the worst persons ever. I will continue to explain this hadith Abu Abdul Rahman. We have Ahmed from Nigeria. Ahmed. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I have two questions here, Sheikh. Yes, sir. Uh, the first question is, um, is every hadith from Bukhari 100% um, authentic? Every single hadith. Okay. Uh, and uh, the second question is, after ten times, after um, Maghrib and, and Fajr, is that, um, is that prescribed from the Sunnah? Um, and, and the reward is that um, uh, f from Maghrib to Fajr, um, you're protected from, uh, you, you're guaranteed Jannah if you die. And okay. from Maghrib to Fajr as well. Okay. And I will answer you, inshallah. No. Barakallah fi. Uh, Abu Abdul Rahman. So when we come to the hadith, there is nothing to confuse you. Because first of all, we know who our Prophet is, alayhi salatu wasalam. And he 
was definitely not a man to meet people with two faces or a hypocrite. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem. He was the best of men, the most courageous of men. He would never conceal the truth for being afraid or intimidated by anyone. However, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, may Allah have mercy on his soul, explained this in his beautiful book, Fath al-Bari, when he said that there is a difference between what is known in Arabic as mudarat and mudahana. Basically, mudahana is compromising the religion for purposes of this worldly matters. So I would probably see something that is evil and not say anything about it because I want money, I want power, I want influence, I want favors with that person. So I'm compromising my deen. I'm not telling them, come, it's time for prayer because I need something from them. And this is mudahana. Allah says, what do law tudihinu fayudhinun? They would wish that you compromise, O Muhammad, your religion, worship their lords and idols for a year, and they would worship your Lord for a year. Mudarat is different. Mudarat is compromising your rights in this world for a higher purpose. So you forgive those who wrong you for the sake of Allah. People would think that you're a coward, you're weak, you're this and that. No, you're doing it for the sake of Allah. Azza wa Jal. Others would um, pr probably, someone took your money and he's making a fool out of you and pulling one at you. And you said, take it, I, I don't care. As long as I'm, I'm, I protect my reputation, I'm not willing to go into such a thing. When we come to the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, before the man came in, the Prophet knew that anyone would come in, that he would receive him in a very nice manner, honor him, host him, and treat him in, as a VIP. And therefore, the Prophet والسلام, feared that if he were to deal with this person who's evil in nature, that those around him would think that he is one of the dignitaries or one of the scholars or one of the righteous people and be, cons be uh, uh, fooled by uh, that and be deceived by that. And this is why he gave them this warning so that they would be careful and not deceived. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. We have a co uh, Maria from USA. Maya. Okay, Maya from USA. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, wa rahmatullahi. Salam Yeah, I have one question and one request, if you do not mind, please. Yes, go ahead. Uh, my my first question is, and if you can give me some light on the on the verse of 15 of Surah Al-Akhaf. 15 of what? Surah Luqman. Um, it's the Surah Al-Akhaf, verse 15. Sur Surah Luqman? Surah Al-Akhaf, al -Akhaf, the, the first the Surah is Surah Al-Akhaf. Surah Al-Akhaf. Okay, well, what right. about it? And because you said something about the bearing and the winning is of him is 30 months. But in Surah Luqman, you said the winning is in uh, 24 months. So I'm kind of uh, confused about the winning period. So, uh, okay, what you're concerned about is how long is the uh, conceiving of a woman of a child, right? And uh, plus breastfeeding. The weaning, the weaning. The yes. second, okay, okay. Okay, what is your second question? Okay, my, my mom, uh, the other is the request. My sister-in-law is sick at the hospital. I'm asking you and the viewers to please make the well for her. Okay, I will do that, inshallah. Okay, Ahmed from Nigeria. Uh, he says that are all hadiths of Sahih al-Bukhari authentic? Generally speaking, for the general public, for those who are not students of knowledge or scholars in the science of hadith, the hadith of Bukhari and Muslim are all authentic. There might be some technical glitches 
Not that the hadith is not authentic, but it's a technical, scientific aspect in a hadith or two that some of the scholars may object to it, but this doesn't mean it's not authentic. It is reported that Imam Bukhari showed Imam Ahmed his Sahih, and Imam Ahmed approved all of it except for hadiths. But having said that, again, it's a technical procedure. Not that the four hadiths are not authentic, but rather there is something in it that could have been avoided or done in a way that Imam Ahmed thought it should have been. And we know who Imam al-Bukhari is. The vast majority of Muslims all agree and accept Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih al-Imam Muslim to be authentic. So don't let anyone come to you and say that, yeah, but some scholars say uh, it is not all authentic. Okay, then what? When you say such a statement, what is your prerogative out of it? What's your objective? He would say, even if you can see it, even if you say, okay, some scholars did say there are hadiths that are not authentic. How many? He says, this is not important. What is important is that the concept of thinking that the sunnah is a source of Islam cannot be valid anymore because we can reject any hadith on the account that there is a possibility it's not authentic, but not the Quran. Once they make this distinction between the divine revelation of the Quran and the divine revelation of the sunnah, this is where innovation comes. And this is what the deviant sects all over the world are trying their level best to undermine. Whether they are the super Sufis or the Rafidah or uh, the Baha'is, Qadianis, um, uh, whatever you call them, they try to reject and undermine the Sunnah. This is why we are called Ahlu Sunnati Wal Jama'ah, because the Prophet himself told us this. And before that, Allah told us in the Quran, in so many verses, but this is not the time to go through it. This is what Huda Channel is all about. We revolve around the same issue, abiding by the Quran and the Sunnah. So, Akhi Ahmed, whenever you hear someone trying to criticize Sahih al-Bukhari or Muslim, know that he is deviant, if not a full-fledged hypocrite. Ask him, Akhi, do you know the Quran? Have you read the Quran? Do you know the tafsir of the Quran? And he said, no, no, I don't need this to, be, to know my religion. So now you don't know the Quran and you don't even speak Arabic and you come to criticize a book that the whole Ummah has accepted to be a source of revelation and accepted that all what is in it is Sahih, then there has to be something uh, uh, hidden and there has to be uh, uh, a hidden agenda. Don't be a fool and accepting to argue with such people because you have to read between the lines and know what their objectives are and Allah knows best. He asks Brother Ahmed from Nigeria about saying la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah lahu mulku wa alhamd yuhamitu wa ala kulli shayin qadir 10 times after Fajr and after Maghrib. Is this authentic? To my knowledge, this is authentic. To my knowledge, there is a Hassan hadith where the Prophet said that we should say this before bending our right foot. You know, when you are sitting for tashahud and you conclude your uh, salat, your right foot is usually erected and you're sitting on your left foot. foot. This is in Fajr. In Isha, in Maghrib, you are assuming the position of tawarruk, where you sit on your uh, uh, left buttock with uh, your left foot underneath your right leg. But again, your right foot uh, is erected. So there is a hadith that stated whoever says this before bending his foot, that Allah Azza wa Jal would uh, write for him uh, 10 good deeds, erase 10 bad deeds, elevate him 10 levels in Jannah. And the hadith that I know of is 
saying la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah lahu al-mulk wa lahu al-hamd wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir no yuhyi wa yumit and you say it 100 times that Allah azza wa jal would elevate you 100 levels give you 100 deeds uh, erase 100 sins and it will be to you a protection from shaitan until the following time so if you say it in the morning until you uh, uh, are at night time and if you say it at the maghrib time until fajr time and allah azawajal knows best maya from the u.s she says that she would like to understand the difference between when allah mentioned that uh, um, the suckling of a child or of, or, or of an infant is two months. And the other ayah, it says that the pregnancy and the suckling is, let me rephrase that. The first ayah talks about the suckling being for two years. And the second ayah talks about the pregnancy and the suckling for 30 months. Now, the second ayah is mentioning the pregnancy. And from this ayah, the judge of Ali ibn Abi Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, concluded that a woman can get pregnant and deliver a child for six years, uh, for six months. So the pregnancy can last for six months. And he concluded this by deducting 30 months of pregnancy and breastfeeding from the two years of breastfeeding, which is 24 months, and the conclusion would be six months. So the scholars say that there is no difference or con uh, uh, conflict between the two ayahs. The first ayah states that suckling can be for two, two years, and this is the norm. And the second ayah, the conceiving the child plus the suckling can be for 30 months and this is what uh, the scholars say as for her sister i pray to allah azza wa jal and ask him through his beautiful names and attributes that allah cures her sister grants her quick recovery and make her stronger better and healthier than before and grant her the ability to thank him, to show her gratitude to Allah Azza wa Jal for his endless uh, uh, favors and blessings. Abdul Rahman says, well, we've gone through Abdul Rahman's question, have we not? Yes. Um, Muhammad has a question. He says, when citing the new moon, what is the supplication dua? Uh, there is a, a dua uh, that I think I can get you now, which is, says, Rabbi or Allah. Let me see it now. Uh, this is reported in a tirmidhi where uh, the Prophet ﷺ used to say, Allahumma ahillahu alayna bil amni wal iman wa salamatu wal islam, Rabbi wa Rabbuka Allah. And this uh, is uh, an authentic hadith authenticated by Shaykh Al Albani. May Allah have mercy on his soul. So, this is to what to say whenever you see the crescent, uh, uh, the new crescent which is born. Hafsa has sent us a question and she says a married woman committed zina and got pregnant what happens if she abort and what happens if she bear the child and keep it without her husband's and the father's knowledge of whom the child belongs to now such questions are depressing how would a married woman 
fall down into such low level. You know that in Islam, if an unmarried individual fornicates and he's caught red-handed or he or she confesses, the punishment is to be flogged a hundred lashes. This is mentioned in the Quran. While if a person is married or was previously married or divorced or a widow and he or she commits the act of adultery, in this case the punishment would be to be stoned to death. And stoning to death is a punishment in Islam only for a person who was previously married or is still married committing the act of adultery, which shows you how severe this sin is. And by the way, this is the only sin to be punished through stoning. If you go through the Bible, there are six or seven different sins, including adultery, that are punished by stoning. So don't jump the gun and say, look how Islam is barbaric, etc. This is a divine law. This is the religion of Allah Azza wa Jal, and He knows what is best. And He knows, subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is suitable for His creation. So when people rely on man-made laws, they tend to failure and destruction. Fifty years ago, homosexuality was banned all over the world. It was illegal. It was hated and abhorred by everyone. Look, 50 years later, what happens now? They're teaching it to the kindergarten kids. They're teaching it in, high, in, in every way they can to legalize it, to make it the norm so that definitely destruction will befall upon them because they go against Allah's law. This is man-made law. They change. While the divine law was made by the one and only who knows us because he created us and he knows what's best for us. We have a short break. Afterwards, inshallah, we'll continue and answering Hafsa's questions. So stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. Just before the break, Hafsa asked a question. And the question is problematic because it deals with a very complicated issue. A married woman who felt into sin and conceived out of this sin and she does not know what to do. So she asks, a question, or Hafsa is asking on her behalf, can she abort the pregnancy? And abortion is not permissible, and this is the consensus of scholars, if it is four months of age and more. So if it's 120 days, it is totally prohibited. And a lot of the scholars say if the pregnancy is less than 40 days, then aborting it is permissible because this is not even a, a, a piece of flesh. The flesh is not or have not, has not been formed yet to that degree. And after 40 days, they say that it is, the majority say that this is not permissible. Both ways, we say that she had committed a major sin. But what is she to do now? If she tells her husband that this child is not his, or tells her father, it would cause so much fitna and tribulation, and it would jeopardize not only 
her own immediate family, but her siblings, her family reputation, her children's reputation. And this is why she's advised not to tell anyone. First of all, she is advised to repent to Allah, to seek His forgiveness, to express remorse, to express true and sincere remorse, remorse, and to try her level best to do good deeds and stay away from sin, hoping that Allah would forgive her sin. Secondly, the Prophet ﷺ said, الولد للفراش وللعاهر الحجر which translates to that when a woman is pregnant and she's married then by, the, by default the pregnancy, the child born belongs to the husband unless the husband objects and uh, uh, refuses to accept that to be his own offspring Th so therefore you're advised not to talk about this, repent to Allah Azza wa Jal, and the child would be attributed to your husband who is the owner of the bed or of, uh, 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 of Al-Firash, which the child was born uh, on, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. We have a phone. Abdullah from the UK. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu wa rahmatullah. How are you? I'm fine, Akhi. Barakallah feek. Okay. Um, so my question is that I wanted to ask if it is haram that, um, I, I know riba is haram, but I wanted to ask that if somebody works in a, in a place, in a company, and then the company uh, offers this service, and then they say that if you do not pay us the money within, for example, within one month, then we will charge you interest. Now, I, I know interest is haram, but I know interest, but I said that, uh, that what is haram is riba on loan. So there's no loaning money, no one's giving any money, it's just like a penalty. That if you do not pay the money by, say, for example, one month, we will charge you more, like, you know, like extra, uh, you know, some 2% uh, of the money you owe. So okay. I want to ask, is this kind of the river that is haram, or is this permissible? Like, it's, it's, not, it's not the same thing that Allah uh, prohibited uh, okay. for us. Any more questions, Brother Abdullah? Yeah, I, I think just the second question is, um, you know, so somebody's going to go on holiday for two weeks and they want to ask, when do you, when can you shorten the prayers and join the prayers together? Can you do it for the whole two weeks holiday or is it like for the first day or like, you know, like uh, when can you do it? Okay. Any more questions? Um, I, 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 I guess the last question would be, um, you know, so when people pray two, to, so when, uh, when, you, when the two people pray together in Jama'ah, um, nobody is it that it's, it's something small, but when you stand together, do you stand in the same level or does somebody stand uh, behind you? That's it. Okay, that's it. Okay, Jazakallah. Yeah. Okay, Jazakallah. Uh, okay, Abdullah has three questions. Now, the first question was regarding the penalty for late payment. And he says that he knows that interest-based loans are haram. So uh, does this fall under the same category? And the answer is yes. See, when you get a service, you are obliged to pay for it. Usually people pay for it in advance. So I'd like to get a phone. I would get a prepaid phone or a postpaid phone. A prepaid is something you give the money in, ad in advance. Once you consume the service, even before the time is over, they cut the service because this is service per the amount of money you paid. A postpaid account or service is the same, but instead of paying in advance, you tell them, whatever my bill is, I'm going to pay it at the end. So they give you a grace period. So you have to pay on the 30th of the month. And we give you 10 days. If you don't pay, then we will put 
a penalty. Now, this penalty is because of your delay in payment, which is now a debt to the company that you bought this service or this product from. And hence, this is totally prohibited and it is riba and Allah knows best. He says that if people go for a vacation, for a holiday, for a couple of weeks, how long are they allowed to shorten the prayer? If, you know, if you've uh, um, watched the beginning of the show, we said that as long as you're a traveler, whether it's two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, then you may shorten the whole period. And shortening is different than combining. Shortening is an advisable sunnah. You're highly recommended to do this. Even if you say, <coughs> excuse me, even if you say that I don't need to shorten, I don't have any need, we say this is a sunnah, you should do that. Combining is something that is given to you when needed, whether you're traveling or residing. So it is best for you to pray on time if you don't have any reason to combine. But shortening, you may shorten the whole period, and Allah knows best. We have a caller, Nabila from Saudi. Yes, wa rahmatullah. Yes, how are you? I'm fine, Zakallah khair for asking. Yeah, I want to ask a um, question about my friend. Uh, okay. She is uh, uh, she is divorced uh, before one year. Her husband divorced her once. Then uh, they redo with each other, and uh, after redo they live together, and now they have a baby, and she's pregnant again. Uh, she, this is her eighth month, and the uh, husband he divorced her again, two times. So now the husband says it's not divorce because we redo first. Uh, is it divorce now or not? So my question would be, she's yes. pregnant and her husband divorced her now when her husband divorced her he divorced her for the second time or also a third time second time and third time okay did he make reconciliation after the second divorce or he divorced her twice at the same time by saying you're divorced you're divorced uh, at the same time maybe five minutes um, apart. after five minutes apart okay yeah. Uh, yeah, but the first divorce, he divorced her before one year. Yeah, yeah this is uh, uh, clear. Is there any other question, uh, Nabila? Uh, no, thank you, sir. Okay, I will answer you, inshallah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, Abdullah from the UK, uh, third question. He says, if two persons are praying together, an imam and a follower, and... He wants to know where should the follower stand, or known as the ma'moom. Because so many times, people tend to stand a little bit further. So is there any authenticity to this? The answer is no. When two people are praying together in congregation, they must stand shoulder to shoulder, next to each other, without the imam getting ahead of the ma'moom. This is the sunnah, that they should stand shoulder to shoulder next to one another, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Nabila says that there is this woman who got divorced a year ago, and they reconciled. Now, I believe that when he divorced her, she did not finish the idda period, which is noted by three monthly cycles. So during these monthly, uh, three monthly cycles, they're still man and wife, but they are not allowed to have any types of intimacy unless he intends to reconcile with her. And in this case, he should notify two Muslim witnesses. So I'm assuming that he reconciled with her before her idda period was over. 
So now they're back, man and wife, one down, that is divorce, two to go. After being pregnant now, he divorces her again. And the consensus of all scholars that when a woman is pregnant, the divorce takes place immediately. No questions asked. And I asked her, did he divorce you or divorce that woman, your friend, once and then reconciled and then divorced the third time? And she said, no. He divorced her twice, five minutes gap. And this is an issue of dispute. So if you are from certain um, schools of thought, such as Hanafi school of thought, they say that these two divorces are binding and they took place. The most authentic opinion is that if a person divorces more than once at the same setting before reconciling, this counts as once. So if a man says to his wife, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, or you divorced, you divorced, you divorced, this counts as one. And this is the ruling of the Prophet himself, alayhi salatu wassalam. But if he divorces her, and then at night he reconciles with her, and a few weeks later he divorces her again, both divorces are valid. So the most authentic opinion, Nabila, is that your friend is officially now divorced twice, and there's one divorce to go. And with this track record of her husband, I think they need counseling, and she must involve his family and her family because this is not child's play. Now you have two children involved in this family, and within a span of a couple of years or three years, maybe less than three years, he divorced you twice, then you have a serious problem. And I don't know whose problem it is. Maybe it is the woman's problem who's nagging and making life uh, impossible to the man, or the opposite. Maybe the man is impulsive and uh, an ignorant uh, uh, brat. So we have to look into this, and Allah knows best. We, Muhammad from Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah, I have two questions. Shoot. Yeah, first one. Uh, in in one of your previous episodes, you said that uh, the people who are traveling, uh, they have, uh, they can cancel their prayer for two rakats, right? Correct. Uh, uh, but you said that when Imam is praying the four rakats in the masjid, they have to uh, follow uh, the Imam. So they have to pray the four rakats. Okay. Uh, but for example, if uh, if one of the person is traveling and uh, at the time of uh, some prayer, maybe Asr or Maghrib, sorry, uh, maybe Asr or uh, uh, Zohar, okay. uh, if the person who is traveling is leading the prayer as an Imam and he is praying only two rakat, and the followers in the masjid, they are the local people, they have to pray the four rakat, right? Uh, yes. So in this case, how uh, you said that you have to follow the imam. So in this case, imam is praying only two rakat. Whether the followers will have to pray four or two. Okay. Any more questions? Like, yeah. Second question is um, there is a hadith. Uh, I don't remember the exact one, but uh, the date ajwa. I think the date ajwa. If you eat the date ajwa and you even you uh, drink a poison, it will not affect your uh, health. There, there, there is something like that. Okay. Is it is this hadith is authentic, or because in one of the debate in my uh, home country, uh, the non-Muslim uh, uh, people have uh, given this uh, date and bring a cup of poison, and they said, "Prove this. If, if this is hadith, hadith is true. Just prove yourself uh, as this is true." We don't know how to answer this uh, to the people, whether this is hadith, is authentic, or uh, if it is authentic, how to prove, uh, answer the answer to these peop okay. people. Okay, any more questions? No, thank you. Jazakallah. Wajazakallah. Barakallah. Brother Muhammad from Saudi Arabia, 
he has uh, a confusion. And he says, basically, the Sunnah, and I mentioned this before, if a traveler prays and the Imam is a resident and the Imam prays four rak'ahs, it becomes compulsory for the traveler to complete. So even if I come late, three rak'ahs late, and the Imam has only one rak'ah to complete. So I join him in the fourth rak'ah, he sits for tashahud, he offers salam, and then I stand up to complete my prayer. I must, as a traveler, pray three more rak'ahs. And this is backed up by a hadith where Abdullah ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, was asked, why is it when a traveler prays behind a resident, he completes his prayer and not shorten it? it, not shorten it. Ibn Abbas said, this is the sunnah, my nephew. Meaning that this is not from my own opinion, this is what the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, uh, told us to do and hence you have to comply now the opposite does not take place meaning that if the imam is a traveler he prayed two rakahs offered salam why does the resident continue because this is again the sunnah whenever the prophet used to lead prayer alayhi salatu wasalam he used to say assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah atimu salatakum fa inna qawmun safar Continue your prayer, yani stand up and pray the remaining two rak'ahs because we're travelers. So he did not tell them, sit, two is enough because your imam is a traveler. And Allah Azza wa knows best. As for his last question, he said that the hadith of the Prophet, whoever eats early in the morning, seven dates of ajwa, then he will not be harmed by neither poison nor black magic. This is an authentic hadith. He said, the kuffar, the disbelievers, challenge us and they doubt this, the authenticity of this uh, hadith. So how can we um, prove it to them? Akhi, why would you even bother proving it to them? They've left everything that is crystal clear in Islam regarding tawheed, regarding morals, regarding uh, excellent uh, uh, of behavior regarding transactions. It's a perfect religion. And they came to this just to challenge you. Who needs them? Don't even talk to them. If you talk to the Christians, I think it's in the New Testament when uh, 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 the devil challenged Jesus, peace be upon him, if he trusts Allah Azza wa to jump off a cliff to be protected. And he said, do not test Allah Allah tests you. So we do not test Allah Azza wa Jal. We know that this is authentic. And this was done by Khalid bin Walid, may Allah be pleased with him, in his biography, that he was tested by it. And he used to do this every single day. And he drank the points and nothing happened to him. But basically speaking, it is prohibited for you to engage in such discussion with these disbelievers who disbelieve in the existence of Allah or associate others with Allah or disbelieve in the Quran as a whole. So don't waste your time. Don't compromise your religion. Don't have any doubts in it. Believe in it. And inshallah, this would be sufficient for your guidance. I'm afraid that this is all the time we have for tonight. Until we meet you on Tuesday night, I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My heart's speech, your mercy is what I beseech. Keep in my heart your remembrance, and in your deen, allow me to advance. Help me in my quest, permit me to pass the ultimate test. Help me in my quest, permit me to pass the ultimate speech. Mercy is what I beseech. Keep in my heart your remembrance and need to advance. Help me in my quest. Permit me to.